we will release our kids from second grade through fifth grade to Kids Corner. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together. Amen. I was a young man in ministry when a gentleman by the name of Jay Kim invited me over to his house. Uh, Jay Kim grew up in South Korea and had moved to the States a little bit later in life, and he was a really godly man that I really loved spending time with. Uh, he actually uh, started a ministry and kind of launched this missional effort to reach the folks in North Korea, and uh, he started this ministry where they built these little boxes with tracks in them and information about church, and it was attached to a balloon that would go up over the border into North Korea, and then it would like self-detonate. And all of the flyers and everything would like go all over this field where Christians in North Korea knew where to go and to be able to find them and then spread them around uh, that area of their country. It was very like secret agent church kind of stuff. Like I really liked it. And Jay was just a really cool guy. He was like in his 70s and um, he invited me over to his house and I thought we were just going to like sit and pray together or chat or talk or hang out. And he said, no, we're going to pray together. I was like, okay, cool. So we sat down, and he's like, hey, let's, let's pray together. So I get my hands out, and I'm like, all right, man, let's go. And I look up, and I'm like, he's not going for my hand. Silent moment kind of goes by. He slowly reaches over, grabs a candle that's on his dining room table, moves it over closer to him, opens up his Bible, and then just sits there. For like a really long time. You know that point in time where it's like an uncomfortable length of silence and you're not sure what to do? We were like well past that. <laughs> and then he started to pray. He started to pray a very slow, intentional, focused prayer over me. And I don't mean that he prayed for me and all the needs that I had and all the concerns I was walking around with. He didn't even ask me what I needed prayer for. To be honest, I don't really think he cared in that moment. He started to pray things over me and for me that nobody had ever prayed for. That something would happen in and through me, that my eyes would see things I haven't seen before, and that I would experience the presence of God in a way that I hadn't before. And as he kept praying, I kept thinking, I was like, this is wild. It was weird, it was strange, but it was very impactful. It was probably the greatest prayer experience I ever had in my life up until that moment. And I walked away from that time together thinking, I really don't know what prayer is <laughs> anymore. I thought he was going to pray for my kids and this and this and that and issues going on in the world and this and that, but he didn't. He prayed for something supernatural to happen in and through my life. Paul's prayer over the church in Ephesians chapter 3 is kind of like that. It's one of his greatest works that he ever wrote. And it's a prayer that I hope we can grab a hold of as a church. And also you can grab a hold of in your daily life as you walk with Christ as the church. And so we're going to hear it now. Let's stand together as we hear from Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Father, speak to us today. Help us to catch things in this text and through your word today that we don't leave here the same. 
Be with me as I've wrestled with this text for the last couple of weeks. And Lord, I just thank you for the work you're going to do today. Amen. Jesus is going to do a work today? Yeah? You ready for it? All right. All around the world, every day, somebody is praying. Right now, somebody is praying. Somewhere around this world. It could be a Jewish person reading the Torah, the Torah and just kind of experiencing God in the presence. It could be somebody in a mosque. It could be a New Age person praying to the universe. It could be an atheist sitting in a hospital bed for the first time, folding their hands together because a loved one of theirs is dying and they don't know what else to do. Somebody today, somewhere around the world, is praying. So what makes the prayers of Christians different? When we pray, what makes our prayers distinctive? What sets us apart from the rest of the world? As a pastor, I've walked with people for years who are honestly like scared to pray, especially out loud. You ever encounter folks like that? Maybe you're one. Here's somebody who's like, somebody says, hey, could you pray over us? And you just like clamp up. You're just like, you don't know what to do because you're afraid you're going to say something wrong or you're going to mess something up and that there's some special formula to prayer. And there's really not. Prayer is in its simplest form, as you probably heard before, it's talking to God. But I think that we do get insecure at times, not because we are afraid of prayer, but because we know deep down in our souls, that prayer is meant to do something. Prayer has purpose. It has meaning. We have people in our lives who have prayed over us, and our lives have changed because of it. And so we get insecure at times because we know that prayer does matter. It is important. And I think sometimes our prayers, especially when the ones we feel really insecure about, they're not bad prayers at all. I just find that at times we can be a little short-sighted. Because the prayer we just read from Paul is a deep, beautiful prayer. And not one that very many of us, I think, pray continually for each other or over the church. And even though our prayers can be a little short-sighted, I think it's just because at times we have the wrong perspective on what prayer does. Um, I want to illustrate it this way. Uh, I have this picture of my son Jacob when he was little. This was the first time he had encountered a hose. The very first time. He played in bath water. He loved to you know, play and make worlds and splash around. But now he had all of that water at his disposal and control. This hose, he could harness all of the power of that water that he loved and he could spray himself. He could spray other people. He could do it at different speeds and volumes and the amount. And there was all kinds of power that he had in control of. And although he loved that element of water, a different encounter with water, he had a different reaction to. And that was when he encountered a pool. When he encountered a pool, he was excited about it. He thought it was cool. But a pool is different. You do not control the water in a pool like you do a hose. A pool is just something you have to get into and learn about yourself in the midst of how to, let's not even say conquer it, but discover new depths of it. So we got them, you know, training for swimming. We got them, you know, learning how to float, learning how to breathe under, not breathe underwater, but <laughs> hold his breath underwater, hold his breath underwater, how to breathe different, how to be able to reach. Remember those rings you throw at the bottom of the pool and your kids would dive for the rings? He had to learn, and all my kids eventually had to learn how to do all those things. He had to learn how to find new depths in the pool. And as they found new depths in the pool, it wasn't really anything they learned about the pool so much as it was they learned about themselves. They learned their own limitations. They learned how far they could go, how far they couldn't go, how much they needed water, how much they didn't need or air, how much they didn't need air. I think we treat prayer like a hose most of the time. Lord, do this for me. Lord, I'm asking you to make this happen. Lord, 
I want to trust you in this, but you got to make this happen for me in this particular way. We spray things down like it's a hose, and we use prayer like it's something we can control. When in actuality, prayer is not like a hose. Prayer is much more of like a pool. It is something that you get into. It is something that you enter into, and as you enter into it, there are shallower ends of prayer, and there are deeper ends of prayer. And the deeper you go into prayer, it requires more of you. It doesn't require more of prayer. It requires more of you to learn how to indeed go for air, to learn how to dive deeper. And it requires you to not just kind of think about yourself and what you think you want God to do, but more importantly, what you want in the midst of it, to allow God to do in and through you, to change you. Prayer is for God to change us, not for us to change God in his hand. We tracking? So if that's the case, and that's what prayer is, prayer is our willingness to go into depths of where God can do what he wants in our lives. I love what N.T. Wright says. He says, Christian prayer is simple. In the sense that a small child can pray the prayer Jesus taught, but it's hard in the demands it makes as we go along with it. Do you have this view of prayer? It's an act of diving into a place where God's presence is, right where you are. And this is not something that we just do individually. This is something we also do as a corporate body, as a church family. Just as you grow individually in your prayer life, a congregation grows in its prayer life. A congregation grows in its ability to pray for each other and pray for God to be in our presence in a particular kind of way. Prayer is indeed the universal language of the church. And our prayers should form our community and make us distinct from the world around us. Not because our prayers are special but the one to whom we're praying for is special. The one to whom we worship is special. Look what Paul writes about ex explaining um, the beautiful nature of the church and what it's meant to do after he explains what God has done in bringing Gentiles and Jews together into one family of God. He says this, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Our church, your life, is meant to, in some way, shape, or form, reveal God's wisdom to the world. Do you wake up thinking that? <laughs> I can barely, like, seek wisdom in my own life half the time, be the one that I'm going to display God's wisdom to the rest of the world through how I am the church. But this is what the church is supposed to do. It's supposed to show something of who God is to the world around us. It's the kind of church we want to be. A kind of church that dives deep. A kind of church that is able to walk with each other in the midst of life and display that wisdom to the world around us. And there's a difference between a church that has people that pray or has even prayer meetings and a praying church. I know that sounds weird, like now they're the same thing. People that pray in a praying church? No. A praying church has something different going on. A praying church is not as easily distracted like sometimes I and we can be. We can be a people who, yes, have prayer meetings and have prayer times and have a prayer list, but we need to continue to search and dive into what it means to be a praying congregation, one that is always in prayer together, not having to wait for a pastor to do a pastoral prayer. And we'll dive a little bit more into what that looks like a little bit later, but if we treat prayer like it's simply a tool for our will to be done, for our hose to be able to spray down, we will miss the work that God wants to do. And we will miss the vulnerable nature of what it means to be shaped by him. And we'll live a shallow faith. I mean, have you encountered people in your life who've been following Jesus for a number of years? And they pray for a number of years, but they never seem to have peace. 
Worry, 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 worry. Have you encountered people who have followed Jesus for a number of years, but they've never really been able to overcome not just certain insecurities, but they've never really been able to come into the presence of God in their everyday life? These are the things we want to change and we want to shift. We want to be a people who enter into prayer every day of our lives and live that out in and through. A community that confesses Jesus as Lord should be moving towards new levels of connection with God and each other. So we need a new perspective on prayer. Paul's going to give it to us in his prayer over the church. He starts off by saying, For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Right away we learn that prayer is an act of submission. It's an act of saying, God is God and I am not. Let's say it together, just so we have interaction. Say, God is God, and I am not. Woo, didn't that feel good? Feels good to me. It feels good to me to admit, I am not God. Therefore, when I pray, that is my very first admission. I cannot control everything. I need God in my life. He is the Lord. Kneeling is a posture of being able to say, I'm trying to figure out how I can do this up here. When I kneel, for those of you who can't see, I'm sorry. When I kneel, can I make anything happen at this point? Can I avoid anything if I'm kneeling? Can I run to something if I'm kneeling? No. I'm in this position here kneeling because I'm saying, this is all I got. (laughs) This is it. I can't run. I can't hide. I can't avoid. I can't make something happen. I am in submission. I have my body in a position where I can't do anything but just be here. That is the first act of prayer. I'm not going to try to make something happen. God's power is greater, and I want to submit and find peace in that. But notice he says, Father. Yes, there's submission, but it's a relational submission. It's a submission to a heavenly Father who loves and cares for us. When I think about this verse, I think about um, my kids when they were little, especially my youngest son now, Asher. He'll do this sometimes when he's in need of something or he's hurt himself or he just wants to feel safe. He'll come walking up to me, if I'm, especially if I'm sitting down, and he'll just kind of like fall on my lap <clears throat> like this and grab a hold and embrace. And he'll just say, Dad, I'm hurt or I'm sorry or whatever it may be. But when he does that, It's this twofold thing of it's an act of loving embrace and saying, Dad, I need you right now. I need help. I need you to help with this bruise I have. I'm sorry for what I did. I just love you. But it's also, in a way, an act of submission. It's an act of him saying, I can't make anything happen right now. I just want you. That's what I think about when I think about kneeling to the Father. Yes, out of reverence and love and honor, but also an embrace An embrace of saying, God, I just need you. I just need you. He goes on to say, of our Heavenly Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And we don't have a whole lot of time to dive super deep into that, but you read it correctly. Every family in heaven and on earth, all of creation... Heavenly beings and creatures and earthly beings and creatures. All of creation finds its origins, its purpose, and its place in God. And he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Some of us live lives as though God is stingy and like unresourceful. I can't do much. And he's not. God is the creator of the universe. He has so much to give us. He has so much love and presence to be in our lives. Do we pray in this way? Or do we pray like we're on survival mode? Do we pray as though God can't do anything, but he's our last resort? Or do we pray as though God truly can overflow into our lives in a particular way where we don't have to live a life of scarcity. Even if you don't have anything, you can live a life of abundance in Christ. 
than what God has given to you. And look at the Trinitarian nature of what Paul is saying here, right? We see this again kind of like we did last week. God the Father has so much to give us, and we'll experience this not through a rule book or some secondhand guide or impersonal way, but through his very spirit that lives in us so that Christ may dwell in our hearts. The entire biblical story is about God wanting to dwell with and in you. And don't miss this inner being line that Paul has. Christ wants to dwell with his people and in his people. And it's this inner being that happens. It's not about just what we display outwardly. Christ wants to work in and through you on a personal inside level. The work of God is an inside job that then finds its fruits on the outside. And that's why we pray in certain ways. We pray for internal transformation. Not necessarily my circumstances to change, but for me to change in the midst of my circumstances. He wants to empower you and give you strength to live the life he's called you to. He wants to empower us as a church to live out the mission God has given us. To love him and to love others. And he says this, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the full measure and the fullness of God. That's a lot there. But did you catch it? Look what he says. While being rooted and established in Christ's love, we should both be able to grasp God's love, but it's also love that surpasses knowledge. How's that possible? Do you find that in your relationships that you have? Like with your spouse or kids or grandkids or friends? There's a love that like you understand it, but at times they do things where there's a love that just kind of blows your mind from them. I'm still amazed that Leslie said yes (laughs) all those years ago. There's a knowledge here of God's love that should blow our mind. But we should also be able to somehow even be able to grasp it in some way, shape, or form. It's a love that is wide enough to embrace the whole world. It's a love that is long enough to last all of eternity. And it's a love high enough to reach the heavens and the cosmos and all creation. And it's a love deep enough to reach the lowest of sinners. This is a love that we get invited into. A.W. Tozer says, Because God is self-existent, his love had no beginning. Because he is eternal, his love can have no end. Because he is infinite, it has no limit. Because he is holy, it is the quintessence of all spotless purity. Because he is immense, his love is an incomprehensibly vast bottomless, shoreless sea. That is what we enter into. The presence of God and his love is not something we can control like with a hose. It's not even just a pool we can enter into and pray ourselves into. It is a vast, bottomless, shoreless sea. Is that what you think of when you think of God's presence in your life and how you're entering into relationship with him? And so it makes, like, perfect sense that Paul would say, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. You think you have plans for your life? You think you have an imagination for your future and how it might work out? No problem with plans. No problem with having an imagination. I got a big one. But there's a part of all of us that has to know those pale in comparison to what God wants to do and what he can do. He can do more than you can muster up. In fact, we worry about the plans and things that we want to happen so much so that we don't leave room for God to do very much in our lives. We worry so much about the things we want to make happen, and God's right here saying, I have something more. Sometimes we just need to surrender. And the best part is, all of this is happening in accordance with the work he is doing within us and to the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's the prayer. 
And this models for us this reality about prayer. Prayer is an opportunity to seek God and what he wants for our lives and his church. So, what does it mean for us to be a praying church? What does that mean? Not just a church that prays, but a praying church. Well, one, we need to embrace our divinity and our humanity. Again, nobody wakes up in the morning and goes to the mirror and says, yes, I got divine elements going on. But remember, the church is the work of God. There's a divine thing that is happening among us here. We are not here because of our own purposes, but because of God's. And so we have to own that divine nature, that divine part of who we are. If we forfeit that and we say the church is just a gathering of friends and hanging out and there's nothing divine happening, then God's prevenient grace, God's salvation, his sanctification, kiss it goodbye. It's not real, but we know that it is. So there's a divine nature to what it means to be the church. There's also a human element. If we just say this is all just a work of God and there's nothing human about any of this, well, then we're not real. <laughs> there's context, there's people, there's stories, there's reality. The church is meant to be a mirror of who Jesus is, both divine and human. This is a work that we do together as God's people, but ultimately a work that God has done. We have to have both, which means that we have to talk like we have both. We have to act like there's divine stuff going on in our lives and that God's at work. Secondly, the praying church seeks revelation from God. We want to speak and seek God's continued revealing of who he is for us. If you see God the same way you did 10 years ago, you need to be seeking revelation. There are elements of my relationship with God that I have only encountered because of the last two weeks. <laughs> only. If it didn't happen, I wouldn't have experienced him in that particular way. Your life is meant to have God unfolding revelation into your life, revealing who he is, what his purposes are for you, what his purposes are for this church, what his purposes are for you in your everyday life. We want to swim in that ocean of presence and love and revelation. The praying church intercedes for insiders and outsiders. We should desire to be a church that prays for each other. And again, I'm not just talking from a prayer list. I'm talking about really diving deep with each other through prayer in a particular way where we know there are people in this congregation who are lifting us up in the Lord. If you don't know that, I hope that changes. Because I know there are people here in this church who pray for me and my family. And I can tell you I have seen miracles happen in small ways in my family because of the investment in prayers from this congregation. But we want everybody to feel that reality. In fact, I want you to imagine if you're new and you walked into a church and you saw this going on. You saw people getting coffee. You saw kids high-fiving and getting donuts from Mr. Terry. And you saw people over in a corner praying together. Just because. They're not waiting for a pastoral prayer moment. They're not just waiting for an altar call. We see fellowship happening and prayer happening all over. What if before the service started, we had people in this room who were just dedicated to praying over the service today and praying over each chair and each life who would come in today, knowing that God's going to do something and God's going to act. A praying church expects God to do something. We don't hold him to it, but we know he's working and he's moving. We track him, we understand what I'm saying? Lastly, the praying church is at the altar. An altar is a place where God's people come to pray, make offering, and humble themselves for the Lord. You can turn anything into an altar. I remember one time I was at a restaurant with my friend, and we were um, eating, and we had, our waitress came up, and we were chatting and talking, just having a good time, and we just asked her, hey, can we pray for you for something, anything at all? And she says, nah, I'm not really, not into that, not, not, not feeling it. She kind of walked away. About 30 minutes later, this woman just comes beelining through the restaurant. I thought she was going to attack me, like for real. Like it was really scary. But she came and she threw herself on the, on the table. And she said, okay, go ahead, pray, let's go, let's go. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So we started praying over her. You can turn anywhere into an altar, is my point. 
You can have an altar at your house. You can have an altar at the car. Turn anywhere into an altar to encounter the Lord. And what I'm about to say, I am not meant, this is not meant to be a judgment. It's just something I want us to pray about. I've been surprised at how our altars aren't as filled as they are. On a Sunday morning in particular. That is not a judgment. It's just something that I've been praying about for you. Because I know there are things going on in your lives. There are things that I'm praying for. There are things that you don't say to anybody else. You keep it completely to yourself. That the altars are here for you to be able to encounter God at. In the midst of your church family. And my encouragement to us as a congregation is that we would not be afraid to go to the altar. The reasons, and I've asked people, like, why don't you think we go to the altar that often? And somebody told me, they said, well, pastor, um, if I went to the altar and knelt down, I wouldn't be able to get back up. <laughs> Which is fair. This is fair. This is 100%. It's true. There's some of us who can't. When I go to pray at the altar sometimes, I'm getting older. My knees pop. You can literally hear it. And I'm like, wow, this is scary. But if you can't go to the altar and, and kneel, then maybe stand next to it. This is a space where there is no judgment. Because I've also had people say, well, I'm embarrassed to go to the altar. Because if I go to the altar, that means something's wrong. Something, there's some issue going on in my life. There's a, a crisis. People go to the altar only when there's a crisis. Foolish! We don't go to the altar just because we're in crisis. We go to the altar to encounter God in any way, shape, and form for any reason. You don't have to have a reason even to come to the altar other than just to take him in. This is the kind of congregation we've got to be praying about entering into. There is something powerful to know that you don't have to have anything going on in order to allow God to continue to speak to you. There are times I love being a pastor because I get to be in this building when no one else is. Sometimes it's scary. <laughs> like, well, there's no lights on. Like, like, you walk in the kids' wing back there and all the lights are off. Like, it's kind of creepy. Like, it is weird. But for me to be able to be here, when none of you are here throughout the week, I get to come into this room and kneel down at the altar and just pray for you. And for the last two weeks, I prayed this prayer. Ephesians 3. And I will do that every week as long as I'm your pastor. You don't have to have a reason. You don't have to be in crisis. I remember when I first started um, in the Nazarene church as a youth pastor, I discovered the altar is the Nazarene church's thing. This is kind of who we are. We're an altar people. Our heritage is steeped in the altar as the Nazarene church. We need to get back to that. And when I started... I was a youth pastor, and um, we had kids that would pray after service and everything. We'd have a time of response and whatnot. And uh, a volunteer came up to me, and he was like, hey, I want to build some altars for the youth room. And I was like, ooh, okay, see how that goes. I'm like, all right, well, we'll see. So I went on a youth trip and came back, and he had built these massive, beautiful altars around the youth stage. And I was like, oh, man, I don't know if these kids are going to, like, be into that. Every Wednesday... From that Wednesday until the time I left that church, those altars were filled every night with 50 to 60 teenagers and their leaders praying over them. I've told you before, the altar is a wisdom bench. It is a seeking of God's presence bench. It is a place for you to come and just seek him. And at times, to be prayed over with your church family. As we bring our service to a close today, uh, we're going to start doing something towards the end of our services that is a little bit different. And this may take time for us to build in, and that's okay. But the last song that we do as a church every Sunday, I want that to be a time for us to respond to what God is doing. Maybe he spoke to you during the sermon. Maybe he spoke to you during a song that was sung or a prayer that was said. But as we stand together, the altars are open for you to come and pray for whatever you need. I'll be over here in the corner to pray with anybody who needs prayer. You need prayer for healing going on in your life? Right over here. You just come meet with me and we'll pray together. 
But the last song, the last chance we have to really be together in this room needs to be a response to him, a response of God's revelation in and through your life, a response to say, Lord, I kneel before the Father. And you can even do that right where you are. But use this time as a response to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of prayer, a vast ocean that we get to enter into to experience your presence deeper and deeper each and every day. And Lord, help us to be a people of response. We've encountered you today. That should change something in us. We should leave here a different people. And so God, no matter what's going on in people's hearts today, I'm asking that you would meet them exactly where they are, that they would feel your love and they would know your presence and that they would see you at work in their lives. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Help them to know the depths of your love for them that surpasses indeed all knowledge but that they can in some way, shape, or form grasp. And let us be a congregation that can also pray, not just for ourselves, but for those who don't know you yet, that you would be working in a prevenient grace kind of way and stirring the hearts of those who need to enter into your family. And we'll thank you for the gift that it is to be the church in this time. Amen.